Lorna, tell us about our guest. He has authored 31 books, counseled six U.S. presidents, 10,000 attend the Crystal Cathedral, and now an audience of 67 million households receive Hour of Power broadcasts each Sunday. Please welcome Dr. Robert H. Schuler. Great to have you. Thank you. Okay. We're happy to see you. I like the energy I feel here. Good. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit is present, it will impact the human personality and energy will exude. Yeah, absolutely. So very healthy sign of emotional, mental, and spiritual health. That energy I feel here. Hmm. <laughs> I like it. Is there anything difficult about doing television? After all these years, such a huge <sighs> audience, is there anything difficult left in it for you? Oh, it always is difficult for me in my, our case. Uh, it's the pressure of fundraising. Really? Oh, yes. Hmm. See, I started a church, and I had to buy, raise money to buy ground and then to build buildings. I'm very much into architecture on a global scale, so my level of excellence and elegance is pretty high, so that's expensive. It's terribly costly to commit yourself to excellence and never surrender to the temptation of mediocrity. Well, why has and that affects cash flow. Yeah. <laughs> but right. that has made your way around the world. Yes, and that, that demands yeah. an audience. That demands respect and honor yes. by heads of nations literally yes. around the world because yes. they see the excellence with which you have proceeded. Yes, and that's been true in television, too. We are uh, the fourth longest-running television weekly show in the United States. The other threes are Meet the Press, Face the Nation, 60 Minutes, and then a few months later, Robert Schuller's Hour of Power. But we are the longest running weekly television show that's not sponsored either by a denomination, a religious group, or cars and toothpaste. We are the longest, we're the longest running weekly viewer supported program in the United States. And when I say that, that's my way of saying thank you to the people who make it happen. I don't think I do a thing. I am an impulsive, impertinent, intuitive, instinctive prayer and thinker. And God gives me ideas and they come out of my mouth before I think through. I don't think what I said before I said it. And then people believe it. And then they expect me to deliver. And that's the pressure I live under. It is a lot of pressure. You, um, is that too long a sermon? No, no, it's terrific. We can do whatever he wants, right? Um, but you're, you've had so many memorable guests on the Hour of Power as well. What is one of your most recent, most memorable people that you've had on? Oh, goodness. Should have warned you first, eh? Yeah, you should have warned me first. Let's see. I don't know, but I've got, next time David Maines is in town for a weekend, <laughs> I'd like to have him be my guest, you know. Because Arvella books many of these. Does she, uh, your wife Arvella is your executive producer. She is executive producer. Uh, the television program started in 1969 when Billy Graham had a crusade in Anaheim Stadium, and I sang in a college quartet that provided the music for him when he was just a preacher at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. Well, that was uh, 50 some years ago. And, uh, can you talk over this? Sure. We, 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 uh, I you're think I can talk. You're also giving us some archival footage. There okay. it is here on this Tell screen. us what we're seeing. Okay, so I, w I went to California uh, in a call to start a new church, and we had no money, so we used a drive-in theater. I invited Norman Peel to come and preach because nobody knew me, and they wouldn't come to hear me preach, but he was famous. <laughs> so he was a crowd puller. I, I created that little design with a cross on it, tried to make it look religious on a rooftop of a snack bar. And so there we started, $500, and there's my wife. We will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary this summer. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> now, she was your only member when you first went there, I understand. She was the only member, that is correct. <laughs> but, she uh, must draw a crowd also, but then. But she quickly got pregnant, so I knew we'd have a growing church. <laughs> We had a four-year-old daughter, a three-month-old three baby boy, uh, who is Reverend Robert Dr. Schuler II, and uh, has been tapped to succeed me by the Board of Trustees when I step down, whenever that is, and, or if I'm removed by God sooner. 
And there's a Robert Schuller III, who is a freshman at Oral Roberts University, who's turned on for Jesus Christ and is so impassioned. And uh, I predict that uh, 30 years from now, he's going to be one of the most powerful Christian voices in the world. Wow. It's Robert Schuller III. What, mm. ha yeah. what have Lorna, you... Lorna, just hold yeah. it for a moment mm. here. I have 15 grandchildren. I have 18. That, okay, I have... That, you got me beat. <laughs> but when you say that, that gets me in the old pump here. I yeah. assure you of that. Isn't that thrilling? Yeah. To see your grandchildren doing so well with Jesus Christ. You know what? This is a... I have a great testimony. So do you. We hear testimonies of people, and we praise the Lord for them, who got into all kinds of trouble, drugs, etc., in prison, and then they were born again, and they're saved. But what we don't hear enough today are the testimonies like yours, like mine. We were married in the faith. We lived the faith. And our children have grown up in that faith. They saw it for real in your home. Nobody knows you and your wife better than your kids. And they all love Jesus. Now what does that say about you? What does that say about your faith? It says everything. And that's our testimony. We've lived it. And our children have that testimony. Mm. Isn't that great? Fabulous. It is fabulous. It is great. Absolutely great. Yeah. Tell us as young family builders then, what dare we not miss, Dr. Schuler? What you dare not miss is opportunities to let Christ come through your life when you make mistakes, when the curtains are drawn. Wow. It's to be honest with the children. Very honest. And there are times when I got angry in the house at dinner table and I would put my hands down and say, kids, don't blame Jesus for the way I just acted. <laughs> total. total honesty. And by God, they see Christ coming through us. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. You've had family very tough times when you're, I think when your daughter Carol <laughs> lost her leg in yeah, a motorcycle yeah, accident. Yeah, that was a tough one. Very. And what, how do you hang on to God when it looks like the waters are just too choppy? Well, I don't know. I, there have been times when I don't think you do. He hangs on to you. He doesn't let you go. There's uh, a lot to know, too, about just church growth, because you've been hearing rumors next door about what's been happening at his church, that it's going... Absolutely. Well, uh, the uh, pastor of, of a wonderful congregation, which is almost in the shadow of your... It's on the other side of the freeway, but it's nearby, the Reverend Albert Vader's, that's known by a lot of Canadians. Uh, his dad was an outstanding church leader in Newfoundland for many, many years. He told me, he said that in the last year or so, Robert Schuller has been preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with a greater fervor, with greater power, and greater effectiveness. Now, you've been effective for years, but he is, he told me that he thinks you've had a shift of emphasis somehow. Now, I don't know whether he's right or wrong. You can set us straight on that, but he says you're really doing it very well. What are you doing that's different? Anything? Yes, I think so. I think that uh, when I went to start the church 45 years ago, I uh, rang doorbells. Do you belong to a church? If they said no, I tried to interest them. And uh, the first thing I found out that most of them in Southern California did not believe the Bible. So I, I wasn't going to win them by carrying a Bible. That would turn them off. So uh, I was, I've been very, very careful how I expose the heart of my faith to people who would be turned off before I could establish a connection of trust. And uh, now I've reached an age and a stage where the curtain is open and the lights are on and I'm 73 years old. And a lot of the people trust me enough so they'll listen to me when I'm totally exposing my relationship with Jesus Christ and the sacred scriptures. And I think I've been divinely guided in that strategy because doors were open to me that would not have been open 
if I had been as bold and as uh, exposed in past years as I am today. Can, can you back up yeah. to your early years and, and your personal faith yeah. in Christ? Tell us about that moment and then about the call of God and the passion that drove you to this point now at 73 where it's, it's according to this neighboring pastor, yeah. no holds barred here. I mean, you were really uh, I think so. going straight from the shoulder with everything that's in you. Yes. When you read a book, the final chapter should be the big one. When you read a novel, there probably is a shocker in the last few pages. If you're programming an entertainment feature, you save the, big, the biggest star for the end. And uh, God has strategized my life so that the last chapters are going to be the big ones and maybe some surprises. Mm. They're going to be loaded. Uh, my calling, again, this is a testimony. I, my testimony is a testimony of what happens when a godly man marries a godly woman and they live the life in the home and they read the Bible every day and they pray out loud every day and they take their children to church and Sunday school. And that's the kind of home I was raised in. It was a Dutch Reformed church in the country of Iowa, very devout. My mother's brother was a missionary to China. He came home to see me. I was unexpected because my family, my brothers and sisters had all been born. My mother was not expecting another child. And years later, I, she got pregnant. And I was born. And her brother, Uncle Henry, said, so you're Robert. Nobody expected you. He said, you're going to be a preacher when you grow up. And I said, am I Uncle Henry? He said, yes, you are. I said, oh, and that night I added to my prayer and make me a preacher when I grow up. Four years and 11 months old, as vivid as today. And he said, that means you're going to have to go to high school. Oh, and then four years to college. Oh, then three years to seminary. Oh, that's about 20 years. He said, yes. I said, oh, thought nothing of it. What happened was I became a goal-oriented person at that age. And I had a 20-year goal. And I think my whole life has been shaped by that. By the time I finished seminary, 20 years later, I had a goal of building a church that would impact the world. So I took a 40-year goal. I just doubled my first one. And I went to California with a 40-year goal. So that's how I get called into the ministry. And it was not until I was in theological seminary that I really understood why I was saved. Um, I love Jesus. Jesus loves me, this I know. I was raised in the faith. And Jesus was, a, I think, a personal friend to me. I think that's my testimony. That can happen. But it wasn't until I was in theological seminary that I understood how the cross could be the source of my salvation. And I learned in theology a thing called the substitutionary theory of the atonement. That sounds kind of heavy, doesn't you it? Better, you better expand on that. <laughs> yeah, now. I know. I don't. Mean. I've never used that phrase on my show. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you. I think you. Well, Canadians are very intelligent. No, yes. yeah, but Canadians <laughs> haven't had three years. All, all Canadians have no. not had three years of seminary. But the, you better expand in, on in, that. In 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 in, uh, in theology, how could Christ's death on the cross? provide for God to save us of our sins. There are several theories of the atonement. I heard the substitutionary theory, and that was that God had to be totally just if he was unjust. He's not holy. At the same time, God had to be totally merciful. If he wasn't, he wasn't holy. And the contradiction is, how can you be totally just and totally merciful? That's a contradiction. And the text from Psalms did it. Justice and mercy have kissed each other, David writes. And that's what happened on the cross. God said, okay, I will punish myself totally, completely for all the sins that anyone will ever commit then I can forgive anybody for any sin they can ever commit. And nobody can say, you let, uh, let them off the hook pretty easy. And I can say, no, I didn't. I paid for it. Look at my scars. 
justice and mercy have kissed each other on the cross. What I, wow, that was the biggest theological or wow in my life. Amen. You have had some challenges in your life. I'm thinking about your heart attack. Okay, you're chuckling. Many more than just a few. But both are it's Bella. So funny. Both are Bella and yourself have yeah. had heart problems. Is that because of the great challenge you live under ministering to 67 million households? Or is that well, just let's growing correct old? That. that is not 67 million households. I don't know. Who, you know, evangelists count <laughs> arms and legs and they count four when they should count one. Okay. But you are all around the world. You're covering uh, yes. Russia yes. and the, the, the uh, states that yes. have come out of the Soviet yes. Union. You literally are covering the world. So well, I wouldn't be surprised well, if that's great. Your material says that. Not my material, or I'm going to correct it. Uh, there, well, for sure, the program is picked up in enough houses so that that number would be a low number. But that doesn't mean that all those television sets are tuned into me. I'm lucky if I have 6% of the households. But the point is, that I can say this, there is no person that speaks on weekly television to as large a crowd as I have. Whatever that is, I don't know. Okay. And numbers aren't, and I don't like to think in terms of numbers. I like to think in persons. But numbers yeah. are people. Yes, they are. Jesus came to save precious souls. Right. One person is of infinite value. Yes. And what you've just said about the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ in a, on behalf of all of us is the most profound thought, I believe, that has ever come into a human mind. And I, I know you've got to slip over next door to the church. There are a lot of clergy that are waiting for you over there. Really? But I, yes, really, like that's true. They really are waiting for you. And, but I want you to kind of close out the session, if you will, with a prayer that might invite people to come to Christ right now, this very moment, to, to say yes to all that God has for them. Okay, how much time? 10 seconds, 15, no, 30? Take two, three minutes, four minutes, yeah, whatever you want. Let me say this. We are all conceived and born in sin. We're not born perfect. We, every child is born non-trusting. Eric Erickson, the father of child psychiatry and psychology is my major, taught us this. A child is not born trusting. That's why they need to be hugged. Breastfeeding is important if possible. Stroking, soft sounds, sounds and strokes to teach the child trust. That's the first two years of life. If a child is born non-trusting, what does that mean? A child is born without any faith at all. No faith. They don't even trust the person out of whose womb they came. If they're born non-trusting, they're born without faith. And that is the core of sin. Sin is a condition before it is an action. We're all conceived and born unbelievers. And the, the Bible says without faith, you know the rest of it, it is what? Impossible. Impossible to please God. So if I'm addressing the sin of unbelief, I am dealing with sin at its deepest level. And people say, Schuler never preaches against sin. I do it, but I do it so positively, they don't know I'm doing it. <laughs> the core of sin is lack of faith. And why don't we have faith in God who's so loving, so merciful, who's given everything to prove his love to us? Because we don't think we, if he really knows what I'm like, I don't think he loved me. It's that guilt, that lack of what I call self-esteem. And that's the nature of original sin in us. So we need to, how can we be saved? How can we trust him? We have to have an experience that he who knows us at our worst, when he's alone with us, treats us as if we're as good as he is. That's grace. By grace are you saved through faith. So I want to say to people out there, there's some of you, you don't believe in yourself. You have your dark secrets. And there's one thing that bothers you, and that's a sense of shame. You're not proud of who you are. You're ashamed. 
Jesus Christ wants to save you from that. So take him as your savior and he'll be, he'll forgive you of your sins and he'll treat you like you're as good as he is. And then you'll have an experience of being loved like you've never had. And you can know that the most wonderful person in the world is your best friend. That's saving name dropping. So just accept him as your friend. And when you come to see him after you die and you meet him at the gate, you're in because he promised him that comes to me, I will never cast out. So take him in. Thank you, Jesus. You're doing it and people are opening up and let your blessing continue to be upon this wonderful ministry. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Dr. Robert H. Stewart. One of the unique servants of the Lord. I think we have to ask him one more question. Yeah. You started saying the most difficult thing about ministry was television. I've watched this gentleman now for five years. He's been doing this for more than more than 38 years. 38 <laughs> years. Could you just tell our viewers what kind of mountain he's been climbing financially and why the daily partnership that they're giving us is so great? Oh, the I didn't know you were going to ask no, that long. No, but when I hear that this gentleman who has got such a great audience, you but, face but the, thank same you, just the same challenge that you thank do. Thank you for asking. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. It's huge. That's huge. It's, it's huge. But the, uh, the odds are that probably less than 1% of a viewing audience that likes you will ever send any financial support. Really? Because the television is unique in that it doesn't convey a sense of obligation to the viewer. It's, it's there. You didn't ask that show to be on, really. So, uh, and so I don't know how to get around that. We haven't, other than prayer, and the trust that, and trust God, and we look to God, not to people. When I started my television ministry, it was because Billy Graham had his crusade in Anaheim. I was the vice chairman of it, and, and uh, he said, come take a look at my truck. And he took, showed me the TV truck, it was 1969. And he said, let's pray about you televising. So this was a prayer covenant between Billy and Robert Schuller, and so that's how we got into it. Put out the fleece. It scared me, I can't tell you, because I'm a Holland Dutchman and I am so conservative. <gasps> At any rate, uh, the money comes and it's very expensive. There's no cheap way of doing something if you're committed to excellence. And uh, that's by a miracle. The miracle is God knows. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, I got a call from Lee Braxton. Lee Braxton was the single most influential supporter for Oral Roberts in his opening days on television. I don't think there's ever been anybody that did more for Oral than Lee Braxton. And he loved me. And he said, Bob, if you're going to television, let me tell you something. It's going to be a heavy financial pressure. No ministry compares with it. Nothing. Because you have those bills every week. Bills. And let me tell you something, Bob. Look to God. Don't look to men. Mm. Boy, that's helped a lot. 